Section 12 of Great Pirate Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee. Great Pirate Stories by Various. Edited by Joseph Lewis French. Section 12. Narrative of the capture of the ship Derby, 1735. Captain Anselm. I fell in with the land of Madagascar, the latitude of about 24 degrees 13 minutes north, and some time before I had made it, I met with nothing but light airs of winds and calms, and continued so long. My people dropping down with the scurvy i took a small still that i had and distilled salt water into fresh i allowed them as much peas and flour as they could eat that they might not eat any salt provision though i boiled it in fresh water i had been very liberal with my fresh provision in my passage to my people and the passage so long that i had hardly any left and that only a few fowls, and myself and officers, too, had been much out of order. At last, being got to the northward of Augustin Bay, seeing my poor people fall down so very fast, it gave me very great concern for them, but still was willing in hopes of change of wind for Johanna. But the small airs trifled with me, and what there were northerly, a current settling to the southward that what to do i could not well tell to go into augustan bay i was very unwilling i had two boats came off to me the people talking tolerable good english at last my doctor sharp told me there were above thirty people down with the scurvy and all the rest even some of the petty officers were touched with the same if i did not soon put into port i plainly found i should have been in a bad condition for men i consulted with my officers to go into augustin bay and we agreed and bore away for it soon after the wind came southerly and i bore away for johanna a fine passage i had and anchored the next day about four in the afternoon being september thirteenth I thank God I brought all my people in alive, and that inasmuch as I can say of a good many of them, I had a tent made ashore for them, and supplied them all that ever I could, and the doctors assisting with everything in their way for their speedy recovery. After I had been here a fortnight, the winds in the daytime set in very fresh from the north-northwest to the north-northeast finding the people recover so very slowly what to do i could not tell to go out with my people as bad as when they came in i was not willing but resolved to have patience one week more i consulted with mr rogers my chief mate and told him that we must consider the condition of the people and how we met the winds and currents before we came in the people of the island told me that this was about the time of year for the northerly winds and southerly currents, and I told them I thought it better to trim all our casks and fill what water we could, fearing of a long passage, if our stay was a little longer. Mr. Rogers was of my opinion. This, I must say, I found the cask not so well used in the hold, as they ought to have been, which caused the coopers more work. Neither did I make a little noise about it, because I had more words with my chief and second mate about my third and fourth mate than anything else. Having all my water aboard, about eighty ton, twenty-five head of oxen, etc., I sailed the 13th of October, with several of my men not recovered, some I buried at Johanna, and some after, to the number of ten, or thereabouts, Having a fine gale, I made all the sail I could, except studding sails, which I thought needless. 
the wind veered to the northward and i was resolved to make the malabar course as soon as possible for the advantage of the land and sea winds i had one passenger aboard a sad troublesome wicked fellow whose behavior was so bad that i could hardly forbear using him ill i forbid my officers keeping company with him but mr b would do it at all events i turned him once off the quarter-deck for being with him there yet that did not avail i came out one night about half an hour past ten my second mate's watch and this b's turned to sleep and seeing a light in his cabin i sent mr cudden the second mate to him to know how he would be able to sit up one watch and keep his own upon this b came up halfway the steerage ladder with his pipe in his hand and talked to me very pertly and that was not the first time this put me into a passion to be so talked to by a boy that i did dismiss him for two or three days and then restated him which was more than he deserved for keeping company with him for whom the worst of names is good enough and those who recommended him to his commission b was told of this by mr rogers by my orders and i told him of it on the quarter deck and told him at the same time i was resolved to tell the gentleman at home of him and asked him what he imagined they would think of him for keeping such swearing drunken company this was before i dismissed him before i came in with the land hearing much talk of angria by captain scarlet and mr rogers and of his great force for i had very little notion of him before i took care to put the ship in a proper posture of defence powder chests on the quarter deck poop and forecastle a puncheon filled with water in the main top a hogshead in the foretop and a barrel in the mizzen top all filled with water chests with good coverings in the tops for granado shells all the small arms with fifty new ones in readiness my ship being too deep to get the gun room's ports open as the gunner informed me the ship sending and the sea washing above the tops of the ports i got those guns into the into the great cabin quarter bills over the guns the rewards and close quarters etc at the mizzenmast shot lockers and shot in their proper station plugs for shot holes and everything that i could think of and gave particular orders to my gunner carpenter and boatswain to have everything in their way in readiness the two lower yards flung with the top chains not being easy in my mind about these gun room stern ports i sent mr rogers it being smooth water to open one of the gun room stern ports to see if we could on occasion get guns out there but he brought me word it could not be done with safety the ship being so deep a few days before i made the land the winds used to veer and haul that offing in an hour i could hardly up from east northeast to southeast but the winds chiefly kept to the northward i was very desirous to make the land not knowing how far the southwest currents might set me to the westward at noon being december twelfth i made the land of goa in the latitude of fifteen degrees north my chief mate wanted me to go into goa but i was resolved not but to make the best of my way for bombay the next morning having a fine six knot gale about nine o'clock mr rogers told me he saw Garia, and desired me to haul further off shore and said if angria and his grabs should see us in his river he would send them out after us i asked him if his grabs came out of sight of land he told me they were afraid to do that fearing the bombay vessels should get between them and the shore and keep them out of their ports 
to prevent running into danger i kept out of sight of land i thought it better to do so since it would make but a few days difference in getting at bombay making no doubt i should get there the last of the month as doubtless we should if we had not met with our sad misfortune when it was too late i was acquainted by those taken in the severn that mr rogers informed me wrong for angria sometimes keeps the shore aboard and sometimes goes directly out to sea sixty leagues off it was too late to reflect neither could i blame myself knowing i had done everything to the best of my judgment but had i been better informed it is my opinion we might have escaped those cursed dogs by keeping in shore and taken the advantage of the land and sea winds i have since repented that we did not go into goa but god knows whether a man goes too fast or too slow for i had certainly a very suitable cargo for that place but my earnest desi desire was to get to bombay the season of the year being far advanced december twenty six being my second mate's morning watch about five o'clock he came to me and told me he saw nine sail of galivats i got up and found them to be five topmast vessels and four galivats not above two miles from us i ordered all hands to be called and down with the cabins in the steerage which was done in an instant and everybody to their respective quarters they came up with us apace having but light airs of winds and found them to be angria's fleet i had the transom in the great cabin and the balcony in the roundhouse cut away for traversing the stern chase guns they came up with me very boldly within pistol shot before six they began firing upon us throwing their shot in at our stern raking us a fore and aft i ordered everything to be got ready for going about to give them my broadside when my chief mate mr rogers and my third mate mr burroughs came to me and begged that i would not put about for if i did they would certainly board us as to my part being a stranger to this coast and angria knowing my chief mate had been off in this way and my third mate had sailed in the galleys i was over prevailed upon not to tack about as the enemy kept under my stern playing their shot in very hot upon us and destroying my rigging so fast i soon after endeavored to wear the ship upon the enemy but the wind dying away to a calm she would not regard her helm but lay like a log in the water by eight o'clock most of my rigging was destroyed and the longboat taking fire astern was forced to cut her away the yawl being stove by their shot we launched her overboard by nine the top chain that flung the main yard was shot away with gear and gear blocks the main yard came next down with the sails almost torn to pieces with the shot as fast as our people knotted and spliced the rigging it was shot away in their hands the water tubs in the tops were shot to pieces and the boatswain's mate's leg shot off in the main top one of the foremastmen's leg was shot off in the foretop and one wounded by ten the mizzen mast was shot by the board wanting people to cut the mast rigging etc from her side found them appear very thin upon deck and desired my younger mates to drive them out of their holes word was then brought me that my chief mate's leg was shot off but that he was in good heart and this time it was a calm and our guns of the broadside of no service not being able during the engagement to bring one gun to bear upon them they kept throwing their shot so thick in at our stern with a continual fire and we returned it as fast as we could load and fire about one my mainmast was shot by the board and the fall of that stove the pinnace on the booms 
the loss of my mainmast gave me a very great concern, and seeing the condition of the foremast, the foreyard halfway down, and the topsail yardum sprung in several places, the head of the top gallant mast shot away, rendered that mast quite useless. I could not see which way it was in the power of men to save us from these dogs. However, I made myself as easy as could be expected, and kept my thoughts to myself. Though the shot were like hail about my ears, I thank God I escaped them. Neither did they give me much uneasiness as to my person. The grabs perceiving their great advantage by the fall of our mainmast, etc., though all the time before within musket shot, come up boldly within call, throwing in at our stern double round and partridge as fast as they could load and fire. We doing the same with bolts, etc. We saw a great many holes in their sails. Soon after this, they lodged two double head shot and a large stone in the foremast, the shrouds of which were mostly gone. I often sent Captain Scarlet to Mr. Cudden to encourage the people, and to take care to cool his guns and not fire in haste, but take good aim. We received two double-headed shot in the bread-room, which were soon plugged up, and one shot under the larboard chest-tree, but so low in the water that could not get at it, and the ship proved leaky. I had a pack of sad, cowardly, ignorant dogs as ever came into a ship. As to my common sailors, who were not above twelve seamen, with the officers, they stood by me. It was all owing to my misfortune on the mouse, that I was so poorly manned. As to my third mate, B, he did not seem to stomach what he was about. He was sometimes on the quarter-deck, not being able to use any guns but the stern chase, and every shot the enemy fired, he cowardly trembled, with his head almost down to the deck. This Captain Scarlet has often declared to the gentlemen at Bombay, and before those that are now coming home, I had six men killed, and six their legs shot off, with several others wounded by their partridge shot, etc. Had our people kept the deck like men, there must have been several more killed, and wounded. About three, I heard a great call for shot, and desired Captain Scarlet to go to Mr. Cudden and tell him not to fire in waste. We lay now just like a wreck in the sea, and at our wits' ends. Our shot being almost spent, we had a hole cut in the well to try to come at the companies. We continued on with double round and partridge and bolts, etc., with a double allowance of powder to each gun, doing the utmost we could to save the ship. The tiller rope was now shot away, though of no service before. The carpenter told me the ship made a great deal of water and had above two foot in her hold. The caulker afterwards told me she had three foot. I saw nothing we could do more than firing our stern chase. There was a sad complaint for shot. However, we fired bolts. I called out to the people to have good hearts and went into the roundhouse to encourage them there. It was very hard we could stand no chance for a mast of theirs, nor no lucky shot to disable some of them, in all the number that we fired. As to our small arms, they were of little service, they keeping their men so close, the rigging of the foremast being gone, and that fetching so much way, I expected it to go every minute and about seven in the evening, the ship falling off into the trough of the sea, the foremast came by the board. It was now about four o'clock, when Mr. Thomas Rogers, my chief mate, sent my steward to desire to speak with me. When I went to him, he spoke to me in this purpose. Sir, says he, I am informed what condition the ship is in. As her masts are gone, you had better not be obstinate, in standing out longer. It will only be the means of making more objects, of murdering more men, 
and all to no purpose, but to be used worse by the enemy, for it is impossible to get away. Therefore, you had better surrender. To the best of my knowledge, I hardly made him any answer, nor had I, before he sent to me, the least thoughts of surrendering, which I declare before God and man, though I was well convinced within myself that it was impossible to save the ship. I went up to my old station, the quarter-deck, and took several turns, as usual, and proceeded in the engagement. I begun to consider what Mr. Rogers told me, and the condition of the ship, and argue within myself the impossibility of doing any more, for if a gale had sprung up, it could be of no service. And all the time from the fall of our mainmast, the enemy were got so near that I could hear them talk, and my second mate did the same. As to our masts, they had gained their ends, and their only business now was to fire at the hull. There was no hopes of their leaving us, considering the condition they had brought us to, and it could not be long before we sunk, for as they lay so near us and so low in water, our shot must doubtless fly over them. At last I was of Mr. Rogers' opinion, that it was only sacrificing the men to no purpose, for they had so large a mark of us, they could not miss us, and during all the engagement, as they played their shot, so hot at our stern, it is surprising there were not many more men killed. I then sent for my second and third mate, and told them Mr. Rogers' opinion, and my own. They both agreed to it, and consented to the surrendering of the ship. So we submitted to the enemy, finding it in vain to proceed. By my watch, it was five o'clock. My second and third mate went into the steerage, to forbid firing, and myself in the roundhouse did the same. Everybody seemed to be very well satisfied as to the surrendering part, and no objection was made. Colors we had none to strike. Those in the ensign staff were shot to pieces, and what was left of the ensign, being made fast to the main shrouds, went with the mast. Captain Scarlet went into the roundhouse and called the enemy on board and told them we had no boats. They sent their dinghy aboard with four men for me and my chief officers. They left two of the four aboard the derby. Myself and my second mate went in the dinghy aboard the grab. We were gone an hour and a half good, if not more. Then we returned in a gallivat with fifty or sixty men, but not a soul went aboard the derby, till we returned. Then came aboard more gallivats and more men, and secured the arms, etc., and drove our people up, some to the pumps, and some to clear the rigging off the ship's side. They transkipped to their grabs what treasure could be got at, and the next day turned out the remainder with myself, Scarlet, Cudden, the two ladies, and my servants, into one of the grabs. End of 12. Narrative of the capture of the ship Derby. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, gis.depaul.edu slash pmcafee. Section 13 of Great Pirate Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee. Great Pirate Stories by Various. Edited by Joseph Louis French. Section 13. Francis Lolonois, the slave who became a pirate king, John Esquemeling. Francis Lolonois was a native of that territory in France, which is called Les Sables d'Olon, or the Sands of Olon. In his youth he was transported to the Caribbee Islands, in quality of servant, 
or slave, according to custom, having served his time, he came to Hispaniola. Here he joined for some time with the hunters, before he began his robberies upon the Spaniards. At first he made two or three voyages as a common mariner, wherein he behaved himself so courageously as to gain the favor of the governor of Tortuga, Monsieur de la Place, insomuch that he gave him a ship in which he might seek his fortune, which was very favorable to him at first, for in a short time he got great riches. But his cruelties against the Spaniards were such that the fame of them made him so well known through the Indies that the Spaniards in his time would choose rather to die or sink fighting than surrender, knowing they should have no mercy at his hands. But fortune, being seldom constant, after some time turned her back, for in a huge storm he lost his ship on the coast of Campeche. The men were all saved, but coming upon dry land, the Spaniards pursued them and killed the greatest part, wounding also Lolonois. Not knowing how to escape, he saved his life by a stratagem, mingling sand with the blood of his wounds, with which, besmearing his face and other parts of his body, and hiding himself dexterously among the dead, he continued there till the Spaniards quitted the field. They being gone, he retired to the woods and bound up his wounds as well as he could. These being pretty well healed, he took his way to Campeche, having disguised himself in a Spanish habit. Here he enticed certain slaves to whom he promised liberty if they would obey him and trust to his conduct. They accepted his promises, and stealing a canoe, they went to sea with him. Now the Spaniards, having made several of his companions prisoners, kept them close in a dungeon, while Lolonois went about the town and saw what passed. These were often asked, What has become of your captain? To whom they constantly answered, He is dead, which rejoiced the Spaniards, who made thanks to God for their deliverance from such a cruel pirate. Lolonois, having seen these rejoicings for his death, made haste to escape with the slaves above mentioned and came safe to Tortuga, the common refuge of all sorts of wickedness, and the seminary, as it were, of pirates and thieves. Though now his fortune was low, yet he got another ship with craft and subtlety, and in it twenty-one men. Being well provided with arms and necessaries, he set forth for Cuba. On the south whereof is a small village called De Los Cayos, the inhabitants drive a great trade in tobacco, sugar, and hides, and all in boats, not being able to use ships by reason of the little depth of that sea. Lolonois was persuaded he should get here some considerable prey, but by the good fortune of some fishermen who saw him, and the mercy of God, they escaped him, for the inhabitants of the town dispatched immediately a vessel overland to the Havana, complaining that Lolonois was come to destroy them with two canoes. The governor could hardly believe this, having received letters from Campeche that he was dead, but at their importunity he sent a ship for their relief with ten guns and ninety men well armed, giving them this express command that they should not return into his presence without having totally destroyed those pirates. To this effect he gave them a negro to serve for a hangman, and orders that they should immediately hang every one of the pirates, excepting Lolonois, their captain, whom they should bring alive to the Havana. The ship arrived at Cayos, of whose coming the pirates were advertised beforehand and instead of flying, they went to seek it in the river Estera, where she rode at anchor. The pirates seized some fishermen, and forced them by night to show them the entry of the port, hoping soon to obtain a greater vessel than their two canoes, and thereby to mend their fortune. They arrived, after two in the morning, very nigh the ship, and the watch on board the ship asking them, whence they came, 
and if they had seen any pirates abroad. They caused one of the prisoners to answer. They had seen no pirates, nor anything else. Which answer made them believe that they were fled upon hearing of their coming. But they soon found the contrary, for about break of day the pirates assaulted the vessel on both sides with their two canoes with such vigor that though the Spaniards behaved themselves as they ought and made as good defense as they could, making some use of their great guns, yet they were forced to surrender, being beaten by the pirates with sword in hand down under the hatches. From hence, Lolonois commanded them to be brought up one by one, and in this order caused their heads to be struck off. Among the rest came up the negro, designed to be the pirate's executioner. This fellow implored mercy at his hands, very dolefully, telling Lolonois he was constituted hangman of that ship, and if he would spare him, he would tell him faithfully all that he should desire. Lolonois, making him confess what he thought fit, commanded him to be murdered with the rest. Thus he cruelly and barbarously put them all to death, reserving only one alive, whom he sent back to the governor of the Havana with this message in writing, I shall never henceforward give quarter to any Spaniard whatsoever, and I have great hopes I shall execute on your own person the very same punishment I have done upon them you sent against me. Thus I have retaliated the kindness you designed to me and my companions. The governor, much troubled at this bad news, swore in the presence of many that he would never grant quarter to any pirate that should fall into his hands. But the citizens of the Havana desired him not to persist in the execution of that rash and rigorous oath, seeing the pirates would certainly take occasion from thence to do the same, and they had an hundred times more opportunity of revenge than he, that being necessitated to get their livelihood by fishery. They should hereafter always be in danger of their lives. By these reasons, he was persuaded to bridle his anger and remit the severity of his oath. Now Lolonois had got a good ship, but very few provisions and people in it, to purchase both which he resolved to cruise from one port to another. Doing thus for some time, without success, he determined to go to the port of Maracaibo. Here he surprised a ship laden with plate and other merchandises, outward bound to buy cocoa nuts. With this prize, he returned to Tortuga, where he was received with joy by the inhabitants, they congratulating his happy success and their own private interest. He stayed not long there, but designed to equip a fleet sufficient to transport five hundred men and necessaries. Thus provided, he resolved to pillage both cities, towns, and villages, and finally to take Maracaibo itself. For this purpose he knew the island of Tortuga would afford him many resolute and courageous men, fit for such enterprises. Besides, he had in his service several prisoners well acquainted with the ways and places designed upon. Of this design, Lolonois, giving notice to all the pirates, whether at home or abroad, he got together. In a little while, above four hundred men, beside which there was then in Tortuga another pirate named Michael de Basco, who, by his piracy, had got riches sufficient to live at ease and go no more abroad, having, withal, the office of major of the island. But seeing the great preparations that Lolonois made for this expedition, he joined him, and offered him that if he would make him his chief captain by land, seeing he knew the country very well, and all its avenues, he would share in his fortunes, and go with him. They agreed upon articles to the great joy of Lolonois, knowing that Basco had done great actions in Europe, 
and had the repute of a good soldier. Thus they all embarked in eight vessels, that of Lolonois being the greatest, having ten guns of indifferent carriage. All things being ready, and the whole company on board, they set sail together about the end of April, being in all six hundred and sixty persons. They steered for that part called Bayala, north of Hispaniola. Here they took into their company some French hunters, who voluntarily offered themselves, and here they provided themselves with victuals and necessaries for their voyage. From hence they sailed again the last of July, and steered directly to the eastern cape of the isle called Punta de Espada. Hereabouts, espying a ship from Puerto Rico, bound for New Spain, laden with cocoa nuts, Lolonois commanded the rest of the fleet to wait for him near Savona, on the east of Cape Punta de Espada, he alone intending to take the said vessel. The Spaniards, though they had been in sight full two hours, and knew them to be pirates, yet would not flee, but prepared to fight, being well armed and provided. The combat lasted three hours, and then they surrendered. The ship had sixteen guns and fifty fighting men aboard. They found in her one hundred and twenty thousand weight of cocoa, forty thousand pieces of eight, and the value of ten thousand more in jewels. Lolonois sent the vessel presently to Tortuga to be unladed, with orders to return as soon as possible to Savona, where he would wait for them. Meanwhile, the rest of the fleet, being arrived at Savona, met another Spanish vessel coming from Coman, with military provisions to Hispaniola, and money to pay the garrisons there. This vessel they also took, without any resistance, though mounted with eight guns. In it were seven thousand weight of powder, a great number of muskets, and like things, with twelve thousand pieces of eight. These successes encouraged the pirates, they seeming very lucky beginnings, especially finding their fleet pretty well recruited in a little time for the first ship arriving at Tortuga. The governor ordered it to be instantly unladen and soon after sent back with fresh provisions and other necessaries to Lolonois. This ship he chose for himself and gave that which he commanded to his comrade, Anthony Dupuy. Being thus recruited with men in lieu of them he had lost in taking the prizes, and by sickness he found himself in a good condition to set sail for Maracaibo, in the province of Nueva Venezuela, in the latitude of twelve degrees ten minutes north. This island is twenty leagues long and twelve broad. To this port also belong the islands of Onega and Monges. The east side thereof is called Cape St. Roman, and the western side Cape of Cacibacoa. The gulf is called, by some, the Gulf of Venezuela, but the pirates usually call it the Bay of Maracaibo. At the entrance of this gulf are two islands extending from east to west. That towards the east is called Isla de la Vigilias, or the Watch Isle, because in the middle is a high hill on which stands a watch house. The other is called Isla de la Palomas, or the Isle of Pigeons. Between these two islands runs a little sea, or rather lake of fresh water, sixty leagues long and thirty broad, which, disgorging itself into the ocean, dilates itself about the said two islands. Between them is the best passage for ships, the channel being no broader than the flight of a great gun, of about eight pounds. On the Isle of Pigeons standeth a castle, to impede the entry of vessels, all being necessitated to come very nigh the castle by reason of two banks of sand on the other side, with only fourteen feet water. Many other banks of sand there are in this lake, as that called El Tablazo, or 
the great table, no deeper than ten feet, forty leagues within the lake. Others there are that have no more than six, seven, or eight feet in depth. All are very dangerous, especially to mariners unacquainted with them. West hereof is the city of Maracaibo, very pleasant to the view, its houses being built along the shore, having delightful prospects all round. The city may contain three or four thousand persons, slaves included, all which make a town of reasonable bigness. There are judged to be about eight hundred persons able to bear arms, all Spaniards. Here are one parish church, well built and adorned, four monasteries, and one hospital. The city is governed by a deputy governor, substituted by the governor of the Caracas. The trade here exercised is mostly in hides and tobacco. The inhabitants possess great numbers of cattle, and many plantations, which extend thirty leagues in the country, especially towards the great town of Gibraltar, where are gathered great quantities of cocoa nuts and all other garden fruits, which serve for the regal and sustenance of the inhabitants of Maracaibo, whose territories are much drier than those of Gibraltar. Hither those of Maracaibo send great quantities of flesh, they making returns in oranges, lemons, and other fruits, for the inhabitants of Gibraltar want flesh, their fields not being capable of feeding cows or sheep. Before Maracaibo is a very spacious and secure port, wherein may be built all sorts of vessels, having great convenience of timber, which may be transported thither at little charge. Nigh the town lies also a small island called Borica, where they feed great numbers of goats, which cattle the inhabitants use more for their skins than their flesh or milk, they slighting these two, unless while they are tender and young kids. In the fields are fed some sheep, but of a very small size. In some islands of the lake, and in other places hereabouts, are many savage Indians, called by the Spaniards bravos, or wild. These could never be reduced by the Spaniards, being brutish and untamable. They dwell mostly towards the west side of the lake, in little huts built on trees growing in the water, so to keep themselves from innumerable mosquitoes or gnats, which infest and torment them night and day. To the east of the said lake are whole towns of fishermen, who likewise live in huts built on trees, as the former. Another reason of this dwelling is the frequent inundations, for after great rains the land is often overflown for two or three leagues, there being no less than twenty-five great rivers that feed this lake. The town of Gibraltar is also frequently drowned by these, so that the inhabitants are constrained to retire to their plantations. Gibraltar situate at the side of the lake about forty leagues within it receives its provisions of flesh as has been said from maracaibo the town is inhabited by about fifteen hundred persons whereof four hundred may bear arms the greatest part of them keep shops wherein they exercise one trade or another in the adjacent fields are numerous plantations of sugar and cocoa in which are many tall and beautiful trees of whose timber houses may be built and ships. Among these are many handsome and proportionable cedars, seven or eight feet about, of which they can build boats and ships, so as to bear only one great sail, such vessels being called piraguas. The whole country is well furnished with rivers and brooks, very useful in droughts, being then cut into many little channels to water their fields and plantations. They plant also much tobacco, well esteemed in Europe, and for its goodness is called their tobacco de sacerdotes, or priest tobacco. They enjoy nigh twenty leagues of jurisdiction, which is bounded by very high mountains, perpetually covered with snow. 
On the other side of these mountains is situate a great city called Merida, to which the town of Gibraltar is subject. All merchandise is carried hence to the aforesaid city on mules, and that but at one season of the year, by reason of the excessive cold in those high mountains. On the said mules, returns are made in flour of meal, which comes from towards Peru, by the way of Estafe. Lolonois, arriving at the Gulf of Venezuela, cast anchor with his whole fleet out of sight of the Vigilia, or Watch Isle. Next day, very early, he set sail thence with all his ships for the lake of Maracaibo, where they cast anchor again. Then they landed their men with design to attack first the fortress that commanded the bar, therefore called De La Barra. This fort consisted only of several great baskets of earth placed on a rising ground, planted with sixteen great guns, with several other heaps of earth round about for covering their men. The pirates having landed a league off this fort, advanced by degrees toward it, but the governor, having espied their landing, had placed an ambuscade to cut them off behind while he should attack them in front. This the pirates discovered at getting before, they defeated it so entirely that not a man could retreat to the castle. This done, Lolonois, with his companions, advanced immediately to the fort, and after a fight of almost three hours, with the usual desperation of this sort of people, they became masters thereof, without any other arms than swords and pistols, while they were fighting. Those who were the routed ambuscade, not being able to get into the castle, retired into Maracaibo in great confusion and disorder, crying, The pirates will presently be here with two thousand men and more. The city having formerly been taken by this kind of people, and sacked to the uttermost, had still an idea of that misery, so that upon these dismal news they endeavored to escape towards Gibraltar in their boats and canoes, carrying with them all the goods and money they could, being come to Gibraltar, they told how the fortress was taken, and nothing had been saved, nor any persons escaped. The castle thus taken by the pirates, they presently signified to the ships their victory, that they should come farther in without fear of danger. The rest of that day was spent in ruining and demolishing the said castle. They nailed the guns and burnt as much as they could not carried away, burying the dead and sending on board the fleet the wounded. Next day, very early, they weighed anchor, and steered directly towards Maracaibo, about six leagues distant from the fort, but the wind failing that day, they could advance little, being forced to await the tide. Next morning, they came in sight of the town, and prepared for landing under the protection of their own guns, fearing the Spaniards might have laid an ambuscade in the woods. They put their men into canoes, brought for that purpose, and landed, shooting meanwhile furiously with their great guns. Of those in the canoes, half only went ashore, the other half remained aboard. They fired from the ships as fast as possible towards the woody part of the shore, but could discover nobody. Then they entered the town, whose inhabitants were retired to the woods, and Gibraltar with their wives, children, and families. Their houses they left well provided with victuals, as flour, bread, pork, brandy, wines, and poultry, and with these the pirates fell to making good cheer, for in four weeks before they had no opportunity of filling their stomachs with such plenty. They instantly possessed themselves of the best houses in the town, and placed sentinels wherever they thought necessary. The great church served them for their main guard. Next day they sent out an hundred and sixty men to find out some of the inhabitants in the woods thereabouts. These returned the same night, bringing with them twenty thousand pieces of eight, several mules laden with household goods and merchandise, and twenty prisoners, men, women, and children. Some of these were put to the rack to make them confess where they had hid the rest of the goods, but they could extort very little from them. Lolonois, who valued not murdering, though in cold blood, ten or twelve Spaniards, drew his cutlass and hacked one to pieces before the rest, saying, 
If you do not confess and declare where you have hid the rest of your goods, I will do the like to all your companions. At last, among these horrible cruelties and inhuman threats, one promised to show the place where the rest of the Spaniards were hid. But those that were fled, having intelligence of it, changed place, and buried the remnant of their riches underground so that the pirates could not find them out, unless some of their own party should reveal them. Besides, the Spaniards, flying from one place to another every day, and often changing woods, were jealous even of each other, so that the father durst scarce trust his own son. After the pirates had been fifteen days in Maracaibo, they resolved for Gibraltar, but the inhabitants, having received intelligence thereof, and that they intended afterwards to go to Merida, gave notice of it to the governor there who was a valiant soldier, and had been an officer in Flanders. His answer was, he would have them take no care, for he hoped in a little while to exterminate the said pirates. Whereupon he came to Gibraltar with four hundred men, well armed, ordering at the same time the inhabitants to put themselves in arms, so that in all he made eight hundred fighting men. With the same speed he raised a battery toward the sea, mounted with twenty guns, covered with great baskets of earth. Another battery he placed in another place, mounted with eight guns. This done, he barricaded a narrow passage to the town, through which the pirates must pass, opening at the same time another one, through much dirt and mud, into a wood which was totally unknown to the pirates. The pirates, ignorant of these preparations, having embarked all their prisoners and booty, took their way towards Gibraltar. Being come in sight of the place, they saw the royal standard hanging forth, and that those of the town designed to defend their homes. Lolonois, seeing this, called a council of war, what they ought to do, telling his officers and mariners that the difficulty of the enterprise was very great, seeing the Spaniards had had so much time to put themselves in a posture of defense, and had got a good body of men together with much ammunition, but notwithstanding said he have a good courage we must either defend ourselves like good soldiers or lose our lives with all the riches we have got do as i shall do who am your captain at other times we have fought with fewer men than we have in our company at present and yet we have overcome greater numbers than there possibly can be in this town the more they are the more glory and the greater riches we shall gain the pirates supposed that all the riches of the inhabitants of Maracaibo were transported to Gibraltar, or at least the greatest part. After this speech, they all promised to follow and obey him. Lolonois made answer, "'Tis well, but know ye, withal, that the first man who shall show any fear, or the least apprehension thereof, I will pistol him with my own hand. With this resolution they cast anchor nigh the shore, near three-quarters of a league from the town. Next day, before sunrising, they landed three hundred and eighty men well provided, and armed every one with a cutlass and one or two pistols, and sufficient powder and bullet for thirty charges. Here they all shook hands in testimony of good courage, and began their march, Lolonois speaking thus, "'Come, my brethren, follow me, and have good courage.' They followed their guide, who, believing he led them well, brought them to the way which the governor had barricaded. Not being able to pass that way, they went to the other newly made in the wood among the mire, which the Spaniards could shoot into at pleasure. But the pirates, full of courage, cut down the branches of trees and threw them on the way, that they might not stick in the dirt. Meanwhile those of Gibraltar fired with their great guns so furiously they could scarce hear nor see for the noise and smoke. Being past the wood, they came on firm ground, where they met with a battery of six guns, which immediately the Spaniards discharged upon them, all loaded with small bullets and pieces of iron, and the Spaniards, sallying forth, set upon them with such fury as caused the pirates to give way, few of them caring to advance towards the fort, many of them being already killed and wounded. This made them go back to seek another way, but the Spaniards, having cut down many trees to hinder the passage, they could find none, 
but were forced to return to that they had left. Here the Spaniards continued to fire as before, nor would they sally out of their batteries to attack them any more. Lolonois and his companions, not being able to climb up the bastion of earth, were compelled to use an old stratagem, wherewith at last they deceived and overcame the Spaniards. Lolonois retired suddenly with all his men, making show as if he fled. Hereupon the Spaniards, crying out, They flee! They flee! Let us follow them! sallied forth with great disorder to the pursuit, being drawn to some distance from the batteries, which was the pirate's only design, they turned upon them unexpectedly with sword in hand and killed above two hundred men, and thus, fighting their way through those who remained, they possessed themselves of the batteries. The Spaniards that remained abroad, giving themselves over for loss, fled to the woods. Those in the battery of eight guns surrendered themselves, obtaining quarter for their lives. The pirates, being now become masters of the town, pulled down the Spanish colors and set up their own, taking prisoners as many as they could find. These they carried to the great church, where they raised a battery of several great guns, fearing lest the Spaniards that were fled should rally and come upon them again. But next day, being all fortified, their fears were over. They gathered the dead to bury them, being above five hundred Spaniards, besides the wooded in the town, and those that died of their wounds in the woods. The pirates had also above one hundred and fifty prisoners, and nigh five hundred slaves, many women and children. Of their own companions only forty were killed, and almost eighty wounded, whereof the greatest part died through the bad air, which brought fevers and other illness. They put the slain Spaniards into two great boats, and carrying them a quarter of a league to sea, they sunk the boats. This done, they gathered all the plate, household stuff, and merchandise they could, or thought convenient to carry away. The Spaniards, who had anything left, had hid it carefully, but the unsatisfied pirates, not contented with the riches they had got, sought for more goods and merchandise, not sparing those who lived in the fields, such as hunters and planters. They had scarce been eighteen days on the place, when the greatest part of the prisoners died for hunger. For in the town were few provisions, especially of flesh, though they had some, but no sufficient quantity of flour of meal. And this the pirates had taken for themselves, as they also took the swine, cows, sheep, and poultry, without allowing any share to the poor prisoners. For these they only provided some small quantity of mules and asses' flesh, and many who could not eat of that loathsome provision died for hunger, their stomachs not being accustomed to such sustenance. Of the prisoners many also died under the torment they sustained, to make them discover their money or jewels, and of these some had none, nor knew of none, and others, denying what they knew, endured such horrible deaths. Finally, after having been in possession of the town four entire weeks, they sent four of the prisoners to the Spaniards that were fled to the woods, demanding of them a ransom for not burning the town. The sum demanded was ten thousand pieces of eight, which, if not sent, they threatened to reduce it to ashes. For bringing in this money they allowed them only two days, but the Spaniards, not having been able to gather so punctually such a sum, the pirates fired many parts of the town, whereupon the inhabitants begged them to help quench the fire, and the ransom should be readily paid. The pirates condescended, helping as much as they could to stop the fire, but, notwithstanding all their best endeavors, one part of the town was ruined, especially the church belonging to the monastery was burned down. After they had received the said sum, they carried aboard all the riches they had got, with a great number of slaves which had not paid the ransom, for all the prisoners had sums of money set upon them, and the slaves were also commanded to be redeemed. Thence they returned to Maracaibo, where being arrived they found a general consternation in the whole city, to which they sent three or four prisoners to tell the governor and inhabitants 
they should bring thirty thousand pieces of eight aboard their ships for a ransom of their houses, otherwise they should be sacked anew and burned. Among these debates a party of pirates came on shore and carried away the images, pictures, and bells of the great church aboard the fleet. The Spaniards who were sent to demand the sum aforesaid returned with orders to make some agreement, who concluded with the pirates to give for their ransom and liberty twenty thousand pieces of eight and five hundred cows, provided that they should commit no further hostilities, but depart thence presently after payment of money and cattle. The one and the other being delivered, the whole fleet set sail, causing great joy to the inhabitants of Maracaibo to see themselves quit of them. But three days after they renewed their fears with admiration, seeing the pirates appear again, and re-enter the port with all their ships, but these apprehensions vanished upon hearing one of the pirates' errand, who come ashore from Lolonois to demand a skillful pilot to conduct one of the greatest ships over the dangerous bank that lieth at the very entry of the lake, which petition, or rather command, was instantly granted. They had now been full two months in these towns, wherein they committed those cruel and insolent actions we have related. Departing thence, they took their course to Hispaniola, and arrived there in eight days, casting anchor in a port called Isla de la Vaca, or Cow Island. This island is inhabited by French buccaneers, who mostly sell the flesh they hunt to pirates and others, who now and then put in there to victual, or trade. Here they unladed their whole cargazón of riches, the usual storehouse of the pirates being commonly under the shelter of the buccaneers. Here they made a dividend of all their prizes and gains, according to the orders and degree of every one, as has been mentioned before. Having made an exact calculation of all their plunder, they found in ready money two hundred and sixty thousand pieces of eight. This being divided, every one received for his share in money, as also in silk, linen, and other commodities, to the value of one hundred pieces of eight. Those who had been wounded received their first part, after the rate mentioned before, for the loss of their limbs. Then they weighed all the plate uncoined, reckoning ten pieces of eight to a pound. The jewels were prized indifferently, either too high or too low, by reason of their ignorance. This done, every one was put to his oath again, that he had not smuggled anything from the common stock. Hence they proceeded to the dividend of the shares of such as were dead in battle, or otherwise these shares were given to their friends to be kept entire for them, and to be delivered in due time to their nearest relations or their apparent lawful heirs. The whole dividend being finished, they set sail for Tortuga. Here they arrived a month after, to the great joy of most of the island. For as to the common pirates, in three weeks they had scarce any money left, having spent it all in things of little value, or lost it at play. Here had arrived, not long before them, two French ships, with wine and brandy and such like commodities, whereby these liquors, at the arrival of the pirates, were indifferent cheap. But this lasted not long, for soon after they were enhanced extremely, a gallon of brandy being sold for four pieces of eight. The governor of the island bought of the pirates the whole cargo of the ship, laden with cocoa, giving for that rich commodity scarce the twentieth part of its worth. Thus they made shift to lose and spend the riches they had got in much less time than they were obtained. The taverns and stews, according to the custom of pirates, got the greatest part, so that soon after they were forced to seek more by the same unlawful means they had got the former. End of chapter 13 Francis Lolonois the slave who became a pirate king. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, gis.depaul.edu slash pmcafee.
Section 14 of Great Pirate Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Pirate Stories by Various. Edited by Joseph Lewis French. Section 14. The Fight Between the Doral and the Mocha. The Fight Between the Doral and the Mocha. These truly represented a scheme of what misfortune has befell us as we were going through the Straits of Malacca. In the pursuance to our pretended voyage, Wednesday the 7th July, 5 o'clock morning, we espied a ship to windward. As soon as was well light, perceived her to bear down upon us. We thought at first she had been a Dutchman bound for Akchin or Bengal when perceived she had no galleries, did then suppose her to be what after, to our dreadful sorrow found her. We got our ship in the best posture of defense that sudden emergent necessity would permit. We kept good looking out, expecting to see an island called Pulu Baraha, but as then saw it not. About eight of the clock sh the ship came up fairly within shot, saw in room of our galleries there was large sally ports, in each of which was a large gun, seemed to be brass. Her tafferil was likewise taken down, we having nothing that possibly could prepare ourselves, fearing might be suddenly set on ordered our people to their respective stations for action. We now hoisted our colors. The captain commanded to nail our ensign to the staff in sight of the enemy, which was immediately done. As they perceived we hoisted our colors, they hoisted theirs with the Union Jack and let fly a broad red pendant at their main topmast ahead. The pirate being now in little more than half pistol shot from us, we could discern abundance of men who went aft to the quarter deck, which as we supposed was to consult. They stood as we stood, but we spoke neither to other. At no one it fell calm, so that we were afraid should by the sea have been hove on one another at one o'clock sprang up a gale the pirate kept as we kept at three o'clock the villain backed her sails and they went from us we kept closing hauled having a contrary wind from malacca when the pirate was about seven miles distant tacked and stood after us at six the evening saw the looked for island and the pirate came up with us on our starboard side within shot. We see he kept a man at each top mast ahead, looking out till it was dark. Then he hauled a little from us, but kept us company all night. At eight in the morning he drew near us, but we had time to mount our other four guns that were in hold, and now we were in the best posture of defense could desire he drawing near us and seeing that if we would we could not get from him he far out sailing us by or large in one direction or another the captain resolved to see what the rogue would do so ordered to hand furl all our small sails and furled our main sail he seeing this did the like and as he drew near us be a drum and sounded trumpets and then held us four times before we answered him at last it was thought fit to know what he would say so the boatswain spoke to him as was ordered which was that we came from london then he inquired whether peace or war with france our answer there was a universal peace through Europe, at which they paused and then said, 
that's well. He further inquired if we had touched at Achin. We said a boat came off to us, but we came not near it by several leagues. Further, he inquired our captain's name and whither we were bound. We answered to Malacca. They too and would have had the captain gone aboard to drink a glass of wine. We said that would see one another at Malacca. Then he called to lie by and he would come aboard us. Our answer was as before, saying it was late. He said, true, it was for China. He and inquired whether should touch at the water islands Pulo Anden off Malacca. We said should. Then said he, so shall we. After he had asked us all these questions, we desired to know from whence he was. He said from London, the captain named Colley Ford, the ship named the Resolution, bound for China. This Colley Ford had been gunner's mate at Bombay, and after run away with the catch. Thus passed the 8th July, Friday the ninth due. He being some distance from us, about half an hour after ten, came up with us. Then it grew calm. We could discern a fellow on the quarter-deck wearing a sword. As he drew near, this hellish imp cried, Strike you, dogs, which we perceived was not by a general consent, for he was called away. Our boatswain, in a furry run upon the poop, unknown to the captain, and answered that we would strike to no such dogs as he, telling him the rogue, every and his accomplices, were all hanged. The captain was angry that he spake without order, then ordered to hail him, and asked what was his reason to dog us. One stepped forward on the forecastle, beckoned with his hand, and said, Gentlemen, we want not your ship nor men, but money. We told them had none for them, but bid them come up alongside and take it as could get it. Then a parcel of bloodhound rogues clashed their cutlashes and said they would have it or our heart's blood, saying, what do you not know us to be the mocha? Our answer was yes, yes. Thereon they gave a great shout, and so they all went out of sight, and we to our quarters. They were going to hoist colors, but the ensign halyards broke, which our people perceiving gave a great shout, so they let them alone. As soon as they could bring their chase guns to bear, fired upon us and so kept on our quarter our guns would not bear in a small space but as soon as did hap gave them better than the pirates did like his second shot carried away our sprite sail yard and half an hour after or more he came up alongside and so we powered in upon him and continued Sometimes broadsides and sometimes three or four guns as opportunity presented and could bring them to do best service. He was going to lay us a thwart and house, but by God's providence Captain Hyde frustrated his intent by pouring a broadside into him, which made him give back and go astern, where he lay and paused without firing. Then in a small space fired one gun. The shot came in at our roundhouse window without damage to any person, after which he filled and bore away, and when was about a quarter mile off fired a gun to leeward, which we answered by another to windward. About an hour after he tacked and came up with us again. We made no sail, but lay by the to receive him, but he kept aloof off. The distance at most in all our firing was never more than two ship lengths. The time of our engagement was from half an hour 
after eleven till about three afternoon when we came to see what damage we had sustained found our chief mate mr smith wounded in the leg close by the knee with a splinter or piece of chain which could not well be told our barber had two of his fingers shot off as was sponging one of our guns the gunner's boy had his leg shot off in the waist john amos quartermaster had his leg shot off while at the helm the botswain boy a lad of thirteen years old was shot in the thigh which went through and splintered his bone the armorer joe osborne in the round house wounded by a splintered chest in the temple the captain's boy on the quarter deck a small shot raised his skull through his cap and was the first person wounded and at the first onset wim reynolds boy had the brim of his hat half shot off and his forefinger splintered very sorely john blake turner the flesh of his leg and calf a great part shot away our ship's damage is the mizzen top mast shot close by the cap and it was a miracle stood so long and did not fall in the rogue's sight our rigging shot that had but one running rope left clear our main shrouds three on one side two on the other cut in two our main yard ten feet from the mast by a shot cut eight inches deep our fort top mast backstay shot away a great shot in the roundhouse one on the quarter deck and two of the roundhouse shot came on the said deck several in the steerage betwixt decks and in the forecastle two in the bread room which caused us to make much water and damage the greatest part of our bread they dismounted one of their guns in the roundhouse two in the steerage two in the waist one in the forecastle with abundance more damage which may seem tedious to rehearse their small shot was most tin and titanaga their fired pieces of glass bottles do teapots chains stones and what not which were found on our decks we could observe abundance of great shot to have passed through the rogue's foresail and our hope is have done that to him which will make him shun having to do with any europe ship again at night we proceed kept close their lights we did the like and lay by in the morning they were as far off as we could discern upon deck we sent up to see how they stood which was right with us in the night we knotted our rigging and in the morning made all haste to repair our carriages our men seeing they stood after us we could perceive their continuances to be dejected we cheered them what we could and for their encouragement the captain and we of our proper money did give them to every man and boy three dollars each which animated them and promised to give them as much more if engaged again and that if we took the ship for every prisoner five pounds and besides a gratuity from the gentlemen employers we read the king's proclamation about every and sea and the right honorable companies about nine o'clock the tenth july we perceived the rogue made from us so we gave the almighty our most condigned thanks for his mercy that delivered us not to the worst of our enemies for truly he the pirate was very strong having at least an hundred europeans on board thirty-four guns mounted besides ten patterers and two small mortars in the head his lower tier some of them as we judged sixteen and eighteen pounders we lay as near our course as could 
and next day saw land on our starboard side, which was mainland, kept on our way. The twelfth July died the boatswain boy, George Mop in the morning, Friday the sixteenth due, in the evening died the gunner's boy, Thomas Matthews, Sunday the eighteenth at anchor two leagues from the Pulos and Bilan Islands died the barber, Andrew Miller, Due the thirty-first died the chief mate, Mr. John Smith. The other two are yet in a very deplorable condition, and we are ashore here to refresh them. The Chinese further report, the Moko was at the Maldives and careened there. They gave an end to the life of their commanding rogue stout, who they murdered for attempting to run away. End of section 14《Stories》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Varian Will. Great Pirate Stories by Various. Edited by Joseph Lewis French. Section 15. Jadi the Malay Pirate. Jadi the Malay Pirate. 16. Long before that action with the English man of war which drove me to Singapore, I sailed in a fine fleet of brahus belonging to the Raja of Johor, Sultan Mahmud Shah. We were all then very rich. Ah, uh, such numbers of beautiful wives and such feasting. But, above all, we had a great many most holy men in our force. When the proper monsoon came, we proceeded to sea to fight the Bugis men of Celebes, and Chinamen bound from Borneo and the Celebes to Java. For you must remember our Raja was at war with them. Jaji always maintained, in which he had been engaged part of, of a purely warlike and not of a piratical character. All thirteen Brahus had all been fitted out in and about Singapore. I wish you could have seen them, Duhan, Yuan, sir, these brahus we see here are nothing to them. Such breast guns, such long pendants, such creases, Malay, Chris, dagger. Allah, il Allah, our datus, datuk, a chief, were indeed great men. Sailing along the coast as high as Patani, we then crossed over to Borneo, to Ilanun Prahus acting as pilot, and reached a place called Tambas, as Borneo. There we fought the Chinese and Dutchmen, who ill treat our countrymen, and are trying to drive the Malays out of their country. Gold dust and slaves in large quantities were here taken, most of the latter being our countrymen of Sumatra and Java, who were captured and sold to planters and miners of the Dutch settlements. Do you mean to say, I asked, that the Dutch countenance such traffic. The Hollanders, replied Jadi, have been the bane of the Malay race. No one knows the amount of villainy, the bloody cruelty of their system towards us. They drove us into a prahu to escape their taxes and laws, and they declare us pirates and put us to death. There are natives and our crew, Tuhan, of Sumatra and Java, of Bianca, or Benga, and Borneo. Ask them why they hate a Dutchman, why they would kill a Dutchman? It is because the Dutchman is a false man, not like the white man, or English. The Hollander steps in the dark. He is a liar. However, from Borneo we sailed to a bulletin island between Banka and Borneo, and Bianca, and there waited for some large junks that were expected. Our crews had been so far successful, and we feasted away, fighting cocks, smoking opium and eating white rice. At last our scout told us that a junk was in sight. She came, a lofty sided one of Fokien, or Fukien. We know these Amoy men would fight like tiger cats, for their sugar and silks. And as the breeze was fresh, we only kept her in sight by keeping close in shore and following her. Not to frighten the Chinamen, we did not hide sail but make our slaves pull. Oh, said Jadi, 
warming up with the recollection of the event. Oh, it was fine to feel what brave fellows we then were. Towards night we made sail and closed upon the junk, and at daylight it fell its dark calm, and we went at our prize like sharks. All our fighting men put on their war dresses, the Illinois danced their war dance, and all our gongs sounded as we opened out to attack her on different sides. But those and my men are pigs. They burnt jaws paper, sounded their gongs, and received us with such showers of stones, hot water, long pikes, and one or two well-directed shots that we hauled off to try the effect of our guns. Sorry, though, we were to do it, for it was sure to bring the Dutchmen upon us. Bang, bang, we fired at them, and they at us. Three hours did we persevere, and whenever we tried to board, the Chinese beat us back every time, for sight was as smooth and high as a wall, with galleries overhanging. We had several men killed and hurt. A council was called. A certain charm was performed by one of our holy men, a famous chief, and twenty of our best men devoted themselves to effecting a landing on the junk's deck. When our lookout prahus made the signal that the Dutchmen were coming, and sure enough some Dutch gunboats came sweeping round the headland. In a moment we were round and pulling like demons for the shores of Britain, the gunboats in chase of us, and the Chinese howling with delight. The sea breeze freshened and brought up a schooner wrecked boat very fast. We had been at about twenty-four hours and were heartily tired. Our slaves could work no longer. So we prepared for the Hollanders. They were afraid to close upon us and commenced firing at a distance. This was just what we wanted. We had guns as well as they, and by keeping up the fight until dark, we felt sure of escape. The Dutchmen, however, knew this too, and kept closing gradually upon us, and when they saw our brahus bailing out water and blood, they knew we were suffering and cheered like devils. We were desperate. Surrender to Dutchmen, we never would. We closed together for mutual support, and determined at last, if all hope of escape ceased, to run our prowess ashore, burn them, and lie hid in jungle until a future day. But our brave Dartu with his shattered prahu saved us. He proposed to let the Dutchman board her, crease, step with a kris, all that did so, and then trust to Allah for his escape. It was done immediately. We all pulled a short distance away and left the brave daughter's brow who like a wreck abandoned. How the Dutchman yelled and fired into her. The slaves and cowards jumped out of the brow who, but our braves kept quiet. At last, as we expected, one gunboat dashed alongside of the prize and boarded her in a crowd. Then was the time to see how the Malay men could fight. The crease was worth twenty swords, and the Dutchmen went down like sheep. We fought to cover our countrymen, who, as soon as their work was done, jumped overboard and swam to us. But the brave Tartu, with many more, died as brave Malay should do, running amok against a host of enemies. The gunboats were quite scared by this punishment, and we lost no time in getting away as rapidly as possible. But the Kershona, by keeping more in the offing, held the wind and preserved her position, signalling all the while for the gunboat to follow her. We did not want to fight any more. It was evidently an unlucky day. On the opposite side of the channel to that we were on, the coral reefs and shoals would prevent the Hollanders following us. It was determined at all risks to get there in spite of the Shona. With the first of the land wind in the evening, we set sail before it and shipped and steered across for Bianca. The Shona placed herself in our way like a clever sailor, so as to turn us back, but we were determined to push on, take a fire and run all risks. It was a sight to see us meeting one another, but we were desperate. We had killed plenty of Dutchmen. It was a turn now. I was in the second Brahu, and well it was so, for when the headmost one got close to Shona, the Dutchman fired all his guns into her, and knocked her at once into a red condition. We gave one cheer, fired our guns, and then pushed on for lives. Ah, oh, sir, it was a dark night indeed for us. 
three prahus in all were sunk and the whole force dispersed to add to our misfortunes a strong gale sprang up we were obliged to carry canvas our prahu leaked from shot holes the sea continually broke into her we dared not run into coral reefs on such a night and bore up for the straits of malacca the wounded writhed and shrieked in the agony and we had to pump be fighting men and bail like black fellows kafra on negro slaves by two in the morning we were all worn out i felt indifferent whether i was drowned or not and many threw down their buckets and sat down to die the wind increased and at last as if to put us out of our misery just such a squall this came down upon us i saw it was folly contending against our fate and followed the general example god is great we exclaimed but the rajah of johor came and reproved us work well, until daylight he said and i will ensure your safety he pointed to a black storm which was approaching is that what you fear he replied and going below he produced just such a wooden spoon and did what you have seen me do and i tell you my captain as i worked at the company sahib stood before me that the storm was nothing and that we had a dead calm one hour afterwards and were saved god is great and mahomet is his prophet but there is no charm like the Johor one for killing the wind footnotes sixteen from the indian antiquary form forty nine and of section fifteen